recording today's uh, panel. So if people were not able to make it, we'll be able to, to share that out later. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Everybody see that thumbs up? Yes, great, thank you. Um, so we are going to, uh, I wanna to start today uh, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous people who live and lived in the territories that we are all working and living on today. Uh, we engage in this land acknowledgement to both celebrate the histories of the generations of indigenous peoples who lived and still live on these lands and to recognize the violent and destructive means by which our American ancestors achieved their ends of colonization. This recognition is relevant every day, but is especially resonant as a historical antecedent to the events we are about to discuss. Uh, we seek understanding of our place within these histories and recognize that this is an ongoing process um, to build our mindfulness and respect and to work towards justice. Um, if you're comfortable doing so, uh, if you want to share in the chat, and if you know the native or indigenous peoples from your area, uh, please do so now. Um, I live and raise my family on the ancestral homelands of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's kind of nice with Zoom uh, because people are spread out a little bit further, so we're not all recognizing the same indigenous um, groups. Um, I want to take a minute to acknowledge this as a collaboration between academic affairs and student affairs um, and to thanks uh, Provost Stacy Robertson and Vice President of Student and Campus Life Mike Tversky Tavers for the in invitation to present this panel today. Uh, um, I'd also like to um, just make folks aware of all of the programming that's happening in connection to Black History Month. Uh, there's tons of programs, uh, panels, uh, discussions, and if you go onto the um, Geneseo calendar, you'll be able to see and sign up for all those events. So I encourage you to do so. Um, we're going to go ahead and start our introductions, and I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, just give a little background. Um, so we're going to start out with Misha. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Misha. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the president of the Black Student Union. Um, and I'm a tour guide at Geneseo, um, and I'm a special education major with an English concentration. Awesome, thank you. Hi. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. My name is Jeff Cuck. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. My name is Kathy Mates. I am not yet a professor of history. I'm an associate professor, so just wanted to clarify that. Um, I teach uh, U.S. history, labor history, immigration history. And I'm Carlene West, um, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations. Um, my area of expertise is actually Latin American politics, and you'll see why that's relevant when I say a few words later in the panel today. So, Great. Well, thank you all so much, and thanks for agreeing to be a part of our, our panel today. This is an important issue that deserves our attention uh, here at the college. Um, I do wanna recognize um, the role that higher education can play in addressing the underlying conditions that influence this event we're about to discuss. I think uh, we really have a great opportunity to create spaces for thoughtful dialogue where we seek truth and the creation of new knowledge and understanding. Uh, we do want this to be a respectful give and take. Um, so for questions for folks, we're gonna hold all our questions to the end. So the four panelists will go and they'll speak for between five to eight minutes, um, but you can start typing in your questions in the chat if you'd like. Um, I have Robbie Economou who is going to be monitoring the chat and we will do our very best to take those questions in turn. If you wanna address them to an individual person or to the whole panel, um, please feel free to, to add that in. And what I would like to do if at all possible is to try to um, allow you to ask your question verbally. I think it's really important that we have that as part of the dialogue. So we may call on you basically um, with the help of Robbie. Um, and let's see, um, if uh, people are interested in a more thorough timeline I'm about to lay out, I'm gonna share in the chat um, the timeline that I created when I was um, organizing this uh, event but this is even more detailed, um, this uh, document that I, that I just added to the chat. Let's see, so many things to move around. 
Um, and most of the things from this timeline I gathered from a number of different sources, including um, a great outline of like breakdown of minute to minute from BillMoyers.com. I got some things from USA Today, the New York Times and the Associated Press and NPR. Um, there are some images um, that I have in these few slides. They're mostly things you probably have seen before, but just wanna let folks know that, you know, people may find them unsettling or um, triggering. So um, just be aware. So, okay, so throughout the summer and the fall, President Donald Trump and his allies claim repeatedly that he will lose the election only if it is rigged and stolen from him. And hours after the election on November 3rd, before the race was called for anybody, Donald Trump declared the election a fraud. Uh, by November 9th, all the news organizations uh, across the United States have declared that former president, Vice President Joe Biden has won the election. Um, starting on November 9th, uh, and to this day, um, Trump and his allies are refu refuse to concede and continuously um, claim that the election was rigged or stolen. Um, allies of Donald Trump and Donald Trump himself file 62 lawsuits to challenge the results of the election and they lose 61 of those 62 lawsuits. Uh, in the days and weeks leading up to the election, hundreds of Republican Congress people and senators at the national level and all across the United States and in state and local um, offices uh, refused to recognize Joe Biden as the president elect. And a group of Republicans led by Texas Senator Ted Cruz and uh, Alabama Senator Josh Hawley begin communicating that they will not um, certify the election. Uh, on January 3rd, an internal Capitol Police intelligent report warns of a violent scenario in which Congress itself could be the target of an angry Trump supporters in the upcoming rally. And D.C. Police Chief Stephen Sund asked the Senate and House Sergeant at Arms for permission to put the National Guard on emergency standby, and that request is denied. Okay, so January 6th is the day of the, the riot. Um, early in the morning, Donald Trump begins tweeting to his followers um, regarding the stolen election and pressuring Mike Pence to unilaterally and illegally uh, overturn the election results. Uh, around 10 o'clock, Donald Trump stopped the SEAL rally is underway. Um, and Donald Trump Jr. says, quote, if you're going to be the zero, not the hero, we're coming for you and we're going to have a good time doing it. And personal uh, lawyer for Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani says, let's have trial by combat. Um, and that quote at the bottom is from Donald Trump, we will never give up. Uh, that's one of the quotes from the rally from Donald Trump. Uh, around one o'clock, uh, Trump is finishing up his remarks and the, the violent, uh, the, at that point, the mob of, of people is moving towards the Capitol um, at, when Congress is um, in session with a joint session to certify the election results. Uh, around 111, Donald Trump ends his speech by saying, we'll fight like hell. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Uh, around 12, uh, excuse me, 1.30, um, the Capitol is breached, uh, or excuse me, yeah, the Capitol is breached and the Capitol Police order an evacuation. Um, shortly after that, uh, Mike Trump tweets that Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. So you can see the tweet right there. And around the same time, outside and inside the Capitol building, um, you can hear shouts of hang Mike Pence and they actually erected a gallows um, on the Capitol lawn. Um, after around two o'clock, people are moving freely about the Capitol complex. Rioters storm Nancy Pelosi's office um, where we know now, you know, items were stolen from the office. Um, and as lawmakers are just evacuating the house chamber um, uh, using the speaker's lobby, rioters breach the lobby. Um, there's a lot more to look into as far as the law enforcement and when and how things happen, but uh, around just before three o'clock, the first FBI SWAT team enters the Capitol. Um, right after three o'clock, uh, Miller gives a verbal approval for mobilization of the National Guard in DC. Um, but it has been more than 90 minutes since Mayor Bowser of DC first asked Army Secretary McCarthy for assistance and the Defense Department was notified two hours um, prior to um, allowing the, the National Guard or approving the National Guard to come in. Uh, 417, Donald Trump uh, tweets his video. Um, many of you have probably seen this, um, so you can read it right there. Um, but he ends the, the very short video by saying, 
So go home, we love you, you're very special, you've seen what happens, you see the way others are treated and that are so bad and so evil. Um, eight o'clock, the DC police declare the Capitol building secure uh, and the Senate is reconvened to restart the electoral vote count um, and the House convenes about an hour later. Um, eight senators and 139 representatives vote after the violent insurrection uh, to sustain one or both of the Arizona or Pennsylvania objections to the certification. And so what is the toll? I mean, the toll, we're gonna speak about this today, but um, you know, some of the numbers, five people died as a result of the attack on the Capitol, including one Capitol police officer, uh, over 50 metropolitan police and DC police uh, and, and dozens and dozens of citizens were injured. And more than 140 people from across the US have been charged for crimes associated with the insurrection and the FBI has received more than 100,000 um, tips. So, um, you know, that is just to give you a sense of kind of what led up to this event uh, and to give some framing for our discussion today. So we're gonna move right into it and we're gonna start out with Misha. And Misha, I will keep a timer so we can try to stay on track. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will monitor that and we'll take all questions at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Misha. Hi, everyone. So I just wanted to start off with a question. Um, so if you have your cameras on, you can like raise your hand, but if your camera is off, you can use the um, reaction to either, you could put a thumbs up or like a thumbs down. Um, or I guess if your camera's on, you could also put a thumbs up or a thumbs down too, just to make it uniform. Um, so how many of you were told by either family members or friends to stay home on January 6th, regardless of where you were because it was unsafe to go outside? All right, let me just go through because there's a lot of people. Okay. So not too many of us. All right. So actually, just to give a little background about the day for me, um, on January 6th, I was sleeping, you know, minding my business. I don't have cable on my TV turned on because, um, you know, it's all Netflix and Hulu nowadays, especially with the quarantine and stuff. So I actually had no idea what was going on. Um, I was getting ready to go out to um, a restaurant with my mom and I get like a bunch of phone calls. Don't go outside, don't go outside, don't go outside. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Like, I'm hungry, like what is going on here? Um, so then that's when I click on the news and that's when, you know, like reality kind of set in. So for January 6th, 7th and 8th and all the times um, surrounding the um, riots, my family and friends and close family members in my community, we did not leave our house. Um, my mom works as a judge in a court building. She did not go to work. Um, I live on Long Island just to give some more background. So I do live um, in a community up, that's a part of Long Island. It's a majority minority community. However, if you're familiar with Long Island as a whole, um, there are some communities in Long Island that are majority white. Um, so we did not leave uh, just to be safe. Um, so I just wanted to touch upon that and like how this actually impacted different communities. So some people was just kind of like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Like we're watching from afar, you know, I can't imagine what it's like being there. But for some of us, there were actually smaller riots happening right in our communities. Um, so I think that's really important to talk about if we bring it up later in the panel. But I just wanted to talk about it a little bit now because I think we kind of forget sometimes, maybe it's just how did it affect that general area? But sometimes we can forget how it affected these smaller communities and communities all over the world that are watching this from home. And it could possibly be happening on a smaller scale right outside our windows. So there was a riot going on um, in a shopping center right down the block from our house. Um, it wasn't as crazy as breaching a Capitol building, but you know, it was still really scary um, to go over there. Um, if you were to go, like my cousin worked at one of the stores that were on the strip, um, they would shout racist remarks and things like that at you. So it's just really hard to feel safe um, in a community like that. So I think um, that's going to kind of lead into what I want to talk about regarding the Capitol. Um, so I'm going to drop something in the chat, not for you guys to look at now because you're going to need to hear the sound, but it's where um, I kind of got some of this information about how Capitol Police officers were dealing with the situation. But I wanted to focus a little bit on the Black Capitol Police officers. Um, and in this thing that I dropped in the chat, it's just a voice um, interview. It's not like a video or anything. Um, it's pretty quick. It's like 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so what was that day like for a black Capitol Police officer? 
Um, so a lot of the words that were used to describe this day was, I was never in a war, but this felt like war. It was a man trying to defend the Capitol. Um, so most US buildings with law enforcement or politicians inside are really overprotected, right? Um, maybe we should think about asking people like Miriam Carey, who was a black woman who was driving to DC from Connecticut with her younger daughter in the back seat. She made a wrong turn into um, the White House checkpoint, which led to her being killed. So she didn't even get nearly as close as the protesters before the violence began. Um, and it was the only option, the first and only option for just one single woman. So if we look at kind of the difference between you know, the black Capitol Police officers and the black people that surround these buildings, um, it's kind of scary uh, for to look at this as a black student or anybody who is a minority. Um, so another thing that I wanna go into, I just wanted to mention that cause I don't know if everyone's familiar with that story but it happened a while ago. Um, but yeah, Miriam Carey is the name that I can also drop in the chat. If you wanna look up that story, um, it's a really sad story actually, but it just shows us that when there needs to be law enforcement and when there needs to be protection, there is. And when it has to be super serious or, you know, they, you know, they shot her, you know, it's kind of crazy. So um, I just thought that was important to bring up when it comes to like how the Capitol was protected and how law enforcement buildings are protected. So moving on from that, my next and kind of last thing I wanted to talk about was just the irony of this situation as a whole. Um, it was a really, really ironic situation um, coming from someone that has been to a lot of Black Lives Matter peaceful protests on Long Island, um, Rochester. Um, just seeing this protest was kind of like, like what's going on here? Um, these protesters were holding Blue Lives Matter flags while stepping over incapacitated police officers. It was just, it was like seeing these pictures was like, right, what is going on here? So it only kind of made it kind of known like, Blue Lives Matter was not to protect police officers. It was just to directly oppose the Black Lives Matter movement. So I just think that's really important for you all to think about. Um, obviously police officers, their lives always matter. There's so many different kinds of police officers, black police officers, Hispanic police officers, white police officers, their lives matter. But like the Blue Lives Matter movement is not, it's not for that at all, like by any means. Um, and that was something that in the little link that I dropped below, you'll hear the police officer actually talk about. Um, in an interview with the Black Capitol Police officer, he states some attackers actually pulled out their badge and said, hey, we know what you're going through. And he was like, what? Uh, so some of the actual rioters and stuff were police officers, which I think is important to think about because when Black students or Black people say, we don't feel safe calling the police officers um, or calling law enforcement, that's kind of why, because th that was a majority of the people that were protesting and rioting the actual Capitol. Um, so yeah, the last thing I wanna say is in that um, interview, the police officer defending the Capitol building referred to the protesters as racist terrorists, which is exactly what I think they were. Um, all of this just proves that this whole move and this whole riot, it had something to do with Trump losing, but it was partially racially motivated. And I just want us to think about that. We don't have to agree on it, but I just want us to kind of like think about it and think about how ironic the Blue Lives Matter movement is think about the Black Lives Matter movement, think about how everything falls in line together, think about the timeline that we just talked about and just think um, this was partially racially motivated. The Black police officer in the interview, if you click on it, will tell you he was called the N-word over 20 times within the hours that he was protecting the Capitol building. Um, so yeah, the irony aspect just comes from the direct opposition of the Blue Lives Matter movement to the Black Lives Matter movement and how Trump kind of allows this and motivates it um, by allowing white supremacy to still live and breathe in our, in, you know, in America. Um, and lastly, let's just think about um, being a black Capitol police officer and having a mob of white people come towards you holding um, Confederate flags and other displays of white supremacy and how that would make you feel. Um, do you feel safe? Uh, do you feel attacked personally? Because I would be very scared. I like, I want to like say like a moment of oh my gosh thank you because if I was him I would have went the other way and went right home I don't know how he stood there these capital there was like two or three that spoke in the interview I don't know how they stayed for that whole time um but yeah so during Black Lives Matter movements there are no anti-white flags being held up or any symbols of anti-white ever because it's not an anti-white movement it's just you know a movement of us trying to say well hey like let's think our lives matter too that doesn't mean that other lives don't matter 
But then when you see these Blue Lives Matter protests and this riot in the Capitol, you're holding Confederate flags and all of these anti-Black um, and all of these anti-minority things that are just a symbol of white supremacy. So yeah, that's just my thoughts. Um, thank you so much for listening. And I encourage you to click the link and also just think about some of those kind of harder comparisons that I made there. And yeah. Awesome, thanks Misha. You stayed right on time, perfect. Great. So we're going to move to uh, Professor Cup. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and um, you, you can go next, please. Okay, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here today and certainly really happy to see so many people attending. Um, I mean, my view of the whole thing was that it was extremely stressful. And, and you know, I saw it as a moment where democracy in the United States was really under stress and, and really feel that we are kind of at a pivotal point um, and where we're kind of on what would seem to be a wobbly path as to whether or not we're going to become more or less democratic in the future. Um, I would generally think that, you know, we, everybody believes that democracy is good and it's of unquestionable value um, to people. But um, I, th I think the past couple of months <laughs> has revealed that um, partisanship certainly I think for some uh, will we'll trump um, democracy and their commitment to, to democracy and democratic norms. And its fragility, I think, has really been revealed in the events of the past couple of months. The insurrection was certainly the cataclysmic event or, or kind of the most dramatic event because of where it occurred um, at the nation's capital and it was also being violent. But there are also a number of other things that occurred in the preceding months about the challenges to the election that were also very alarming. Uh, Trump himself has really questioned elections in the United States for quite a long time. In 2016, he, he said that actually he won the popular vote, um, that there actually was a quite a bit of fraudulent voting that occurred then. Um, he, he really made it, I think, pretty clear that he was unlikely to accept the outcome of the election as being legitimate, unless it was the case that he would win um, that election, and which he he lost, but he was able to propagate the lie that he won that election. Probably kind of a little less surprising is that much of the public were willing to buy into that and accept that, um, that much of the public was willing to accept his lie about that. Um, you know, he's had what some people are now referring to him as, as mid-level lies, like Obama born, uh, not in the United States, or that he was a, a very, very wealthy man and a number of other things. Um, and the election outcome seemed to be the really big lie that a lot of people at that point were really willing to accept. Um, so, but what was really kind of, you know, alarming, um, there's kind of two parts to this, one, but one part being that many elites were actually willing to go along. So you had some senators and some members of the House of Representatives and some other um, figures within the Republican Party who were willing to accept that lie and seem supportive of that lie. And, and thus were more committed to that and having Trump maintain himself in power rather than demonstrating a commitment to democracy. On the other hand, um, we did get through it. Um, but I also think, you know, that the fragileness again of the whole thing was revealed. So on the other hand, um, you did see a number of Republican officials actually maintain their commitment to the rule of law and to democratic procedures. So for example, the officials in Georgia, um, the state election officials there did not bow to the pressure uh, that Trump was putting on them to capitulate, to fine you know, fraudulent votes. Uh, they stood their ground and they maintained that commitment. The 50 states certified their results, uh, the officials there, regardless of whether or not um, they were Democrat or Republican, they appeared to have all acted appropriately. Many judges, some judges appointed by Trump, um, also acted appropriately and demonstrated a commitment to democratic norms. Now, again, on the and, and so did Mike Pence, actually, at, at the end. Um, it's not clear that really he had anything he could do to change things, and he, he acknowledged it, but he, he, didn't, he didn't bow to the pressure that was being put on him. And I, I see it as kind of, again, sort of a, a mixed but still very um, worrisome um, scenario where you had within the Republican Party one group of elites that were not demonstrating a commitment to democratic norms and procedures and another set of elites that were. One wonders if let's say we got to the future and let's say 2024 
and we had an election um, just like our past presidential election where the Democratic candidate came out ahead. But at that time, uh, perhaps if the House of Representatives was controlled by the Republicans and the Senate controlled by the Republicans, um, might they have acted differently? Uh, in this case, they knew that the, the House was controlled by the Democrats and there's no way that they could not win on that certification. So those are things that I found um, very, very worrisome and very, very um, concerning. I, I hope Trump is an aberration. Um, I hope you know the, the big fight now seems to be within the Republican Party as to whether or not they're going to stick with Trump or to what extent there's going to be a, a faction that's going to break away from Trump and go back to being either what Republicans have been in the past or some new type of Republican Party, or again, a party that seems not really that committed to democratic norms and procedures. I think we, we, we live in an age now that some people are referring to as post-truth <laughs> with just by its name is extremely alarming and misinformation can you know, filter through society and be willingly embraced by people either because it's what they want to believe, they, they want to believe some lies or they're, they're supported in those beliefs and lies by those who are around them. And it's very hard to imagine democracy functioning well in an era where there's so much misinformation and there's not at least some common basis where people are operating on a set of agreeable facts. But, you know, Trump pitched himself as the, um, as the, the only purveyor of um, correct information. He, he called news that he didn't like as fake news. Um, he was the, seen as the only one, or he portrayed himself to be the only one who can solve our nation's uh, problems. He portrayed himself as a strong, very strong leader. He encouraged um, right-wing um, racist groups in the public and um, you know, really brought them out more onto display. Um, I, I think much of the pro protest was racially motivated there. And that's in, in some cases, I, I think, it was kind of an undercurrent of what was going on. In some cases, it was very, very visually displayed. And so from, from the very beginning, you know, Trump has drawn upon uh, mostly a group, uh, at least as his core supporters, uh, when he won the nomination in 2016 of whites who are not college educated and perhaps feel threatened by the increasing diversification in the United States. And, and they have kind of been more willing to follow his message uh, than have others, and, and certainly others within the Republican Party. His message has been anti-elite, anti-truth. Um, and uh, ironic, given that he's somebody who, you know, at, at least says he has at least $10 billion um, there and becomes the leader of an anti-elite movement. Um, so that's kind of how I see things uh, having occurred. I, I see us kind of as maybe a little bit at a, at a fork in a road. Uh, there as to whether or not we're going to um, maybe continue down a path that is less democratic than we would like. Um, but I have found it just both fascinating but alarming at the same time. All right, thanks everyone for coming. So um, my remarks are a little bit more formal. Um, I'm fearful that I'll go over my time. So um, please forgive me for that. Um, as a historian, what I'd like to do is look backward to try to make sense of what's happening now and to try to think about how things might play out in the future. And I'm going to begin with a quote from historian Timothy Snyder, who in a recent New York Times article commented that, quote, it was clear to me in October that Trump's behavior presaged a coup, a coup excuse me, and I said so in print. This is not because the present repeats the past, but because the past enlightens the present. So taking the last part of Snyder's words to heart, that the past enlightens the present, what I'd like to do in the five or so minutes I have here is to briefly revisit the 1898 Wilmington massacre in North Carolina, in which a democratically elected government was overthrown by a coalition of white supremacists. I hope that in revisiting this awful event, it'll provide a way for us to think more critically about what happened on February, January 6th, and what lessons we should heed. Now in 18, very brief lesson here, in 1894 and in 1896 and in 1897, a biracial coalition of Republicans and populists, the People's Party populists, successfully challenged white supremacist Democrats for control of the gov government in North Carolina. 
They won both um, houses um, in North Carolina. They actually sent two senators um, to the US Senate. They won the governorship. And in the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, um, they also elected a, a, a mayor. Now, in response to these re Republican and populist victories, white Democrats formed white government leagues to quote, take back control of the state. And they engaged in a reign of terror to intimidate African-American voters. These campaigns began shortly after the 1896 elections and continued through the 1898 election. The day before the 1898 election, one of the organizers of the campaign of terror, a man by the name of Alfred Waddell, told the crowd, you are Anglo-Saxons. You are armed and prepared to do your duty. Go to the polls tomorrow. He then continued by telling the crowd that if African-Americans tried to vote, quote, tell him to leave the polls, and if he refuses, kill him. Now, not surprisingly, the, the Democratic Party was able to sweep the 1898 elections, retaking control of the state legislature. However, the efforts to regain control were not complete at this point, due to the fact that the Wilmington mayoral race was not up until 1899. So not content to wait another year for this election, the day after the 1898 election, white supremacists issued a white declaration of independence and then took to the streets, burned black property, including the um, only black newspaper in town and killed at least a dozen African-Americans and perhaps many more. They then formally took back the city's governance, installing the above mentioned Waddell as mayor. The coup that had begun with the violent voter suppression and terror leading to democratic victories was now complete. At first glance, what would turn out to be the successful coup in North Carolina and the 2021 Capitol insurrection might seem to be worlds apart, different places, different times, different endings. However, I wonder if that's really true. First, and Jeff mentioned this, we need to think about the big lie. And the big lie um, that in part helps to explain the Capitol insurrection. We know that the insurrectionists who invaded the Capitol with paramilitary equipment and zip ties, with walkie talkies and stun guns, and even inside information about the layout of the Capitol were inspired by the lie that the election was stolen in spite of all the facts to the contrary. In 1898, the white supremacists in North Carolina who overthrew the democratically elected government had their own big lie. The big lie in North Carolina was based on an alleged statewide black on white rape epidemic. In the months leading up to the 1898 election, newspapers throughout North Carolina carried stories about alleged rapes with the explicit warning that these rapes would continue as long as some whites remained in the kind of biracial coalition that led to Republican and populist victories in 1894, 1896, and 1897. These lies were continually repeated in public forums with white politicians and businesses inciting crowds to protect white women and to protect their racial heritage. Now, at first glance, Wilmington's lie might not seem to have a lot in common with the lie of the 2020 election. However, when we think about the ways that Trump his powerful allies and millions of his supporters challenged the 2020 election results, I think that we'll start to see some frightening commonalities. When Trump and his Republican allies claimed that the election was stolen, when they tried to have votes thrown out, they knew exactly what they had, they knew exactly who they thought had stolen this election. And it wasn't predominantly white suburbs that had turned to Biden, but rather large urban centers where lots of African-American votes had been cast. In claiming that millions of votes cast by African Americans had been done so fraudulently, Trump and his allies were trying to do what the whites in Wilmington had done, exclude African Americans from the body politic. Now, the second lesson or parallel that I'd like to highlight between 1898 and 2021 is the issue of entitlement. Now, while it's important to grapple with the economic and security, social isolation, and grievance culture that might help to explain why Trump supporters continue to be loyal to him and him alone, we also need to make sure that we recognize the deep sense of entitlement that emboldened the mob to assemble in Washington, proudly march to the Capitol building, and violently storm the doorways and windows to gain entry. 
the men and the women parading through the Capitol with MAGA hats, Confederate flags, Holocaust celebration t-shirts, and don't tread on me banners, did so based on sincere and deeply held belief that they had the right to determine the outcome of the election, that they were entitled to determine whose votes should be counted. Just like the men and women who took to the streets of Wilmington to oust the elected mayor and murder scores of black citizens, the men and the women who temporarily took to the Capitol did so because they believed that they, not us, are the people. We need to take their claims that this is our house seriously. While they may have been duped into believing that the election had been stolen by fraudulent African-American votes, lies repeated over and over again by Republicans nationwide, we would be remiss if we didn't ask ourselves why they thought that their vigilante activity was just, why they were above the law and order. Finally, I'd like to warn us not to assume that the 2021 insurrection is over, and that in contrast to the 1898 coup, 19, 1898 coup, coup, excuse me, the men and the women who stormed the Capitol failed in their quest to undermine our democracy. Just hours after the Capitol Police and National Guard retook the Capitol, over 130 congressmen and women, as well as eight senators, continued the insurrection by voting to object to certify the results. In the weeks since the last election, Republican legislatures in 28 states have put forth over 100 bills to limit who will be able to vote in the future by challenging mail-in voting and absentee voting, by pushing harsh voter ID laws, by engaging in purges of voting rules. While most of us can see that the 2021 insurrection for what it was, a violent attempt to undermine democracy, we also need to realize that the voter suppression campaigns and unfounded charges of voter fraud, which began long before Trump took office and look like they will continue for years to come, also represent a threat to our democracy. Less deadly perhaps, but even more dangerous. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I, I meant to say that at the top uh, as well, we are going to keep this meeting open and this event open until 345. So we have some time for Q&A um, after. And we just have um, Associate Professor Carlene West to go, and then we'll be able to start taking some questions. So um, go ahead, uh, Carlene, take it away. Thank you so much, Garth. And thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you also to Misha and Professor Cook and Professor Mapes for um, your incredibly insightful words about um, this event. Um, so Misha mentioned a great irony um, in her uh, presentation. And I'm also going to discuss some irony in my own presentation. Um, earlier, I said that I am a professor of Latin American politics. And so I've spent my career studying what makes democracies successful and also what makes them fragile and um, and you know vulnerable to um, breakdown. And um, the great irony is that my mother was actually at the Save America rally in DC on that day. Um, she did march to the Capitol and thankfully she was not uh, one of the individuals to break into the Capitol. And so, um, these past few weeks have been very, as, as Professor Cook mentioned, sort of professionally um, stressful, but also interesting related to my research, but they've also been very personally stressful <laughs> as well. Um, so I, I just want to highlight a couple of things um, about sort of my research and then also um, how that applies to what happened on January 6th. And I'm just going to share my screen because um, those of us that study Latin American politics, we were concerned very early on about the Trump presidency. Um, and that is because, um, hold on just a second here. Let me see if I can share my screen. That didn't work as I wanted. Okay. Um, that's because there is an authoritarian playbook and Trump followed many of the techniques that um, authoritarians around the world utilize to um, shore up their power 
and suppress democracy and democratic dissent, uh, dissent um, and opposition. And so in 2016, leading up to uh, the election between President Trump and Hillary Clinton, um, a bunch of political scientists, and this was initiated by political scientists who study Latin America, um, we signed on to a letter of concern about the Trump presidency. There was actually an, an opinion piece that came in, out in the Washington Post that highlighted um, our concerns. And I've, I've included in the slide a number of the, the concerns way back in 2016 that we had about the Trump presidency. He cast doubt on the validity of the election process. He was doing that as he ran <laughs> for the presidency. He was casting doubt on the electoral process. Um, he stated then that he would reject the outcome of a free election if he didn't win. He, at the time, encouraged supporters to engage in voter suppression. Um, he threatened to jail the leader of the opposition party, right? Lock her up. Um, he questioned the independence of the judiciary. He impugned the loyalty of citizens on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, country of birth, immigration status. And he endangered the freedom of the press by intimidating individual journalists and banning news organizations from his rallies if he didn't like their coverage. So the, the red flags were all over um, Trump and his candidacy way back in 2016. Um, looking back at this letter, um, as I was thinking about the events of January 6th, it just um, made me feel incredibly saddened for our democracy that someone who so clearly drew from an authoritarian playbook could be supported and nominated by a major political party in this country. It is shameful, really, that a political party that was so interested in winning, they could see the popularity that Trump had. Um, whether or not we agree with his popularity, it's clear that he is popular. They could see that popularity and they hope to benefit from it um, in spite of all of these concerns. To me, that's incredibly shameful. Um, and I just wanna highlight that we have a word for this kind of authoritarian populist leader in Latin America, and that word is a caudillo. A caudillo is an authoritarian style leader who often um, surges into a, a political office because they are incredibly popular and because they use populism to, um, you know, to form a kind of alternate ideology, right? We don't just talk about conservatism anymore in the United States, we talk about Trumpism. In the same way as in Argentina, they talk about Peronism. It's its own political ideology, right? And so you have these charismatic leaders who, um, who are, you know, are able to write into office on their personality, on their charisma, and are also able to utilize that popularity to undermine democracy. So Perón in Argentina was infamous for jailing members of the opposition, for stamping out the opposition. Um, Alberto Fujimori, when he became president in Peru, he actually abolished the judiciary and reappointed an entire new judiciary who he knew would be uh, favorable to his perspective. Um, these are caudillos. We are lucky that our democratic institutions in the United States are strong enough to have withstood Trump. And I, Professor Cook pointed this out very well in his, um, in his discussion here today, that we are very lucky that we had en enough strength of our democratic institutions to withstand the pressures that Trump put on those institutions. Um, in an attempt to shore up authority for himself. Um, the last thing that I wanna say is that um, a key component uh, from the playbook of Latin American dictators is the use of propaganda. And so, um, you know, we all became aware of this term alternative facts when um, Trump was trying to boast about the size of his inauguration crowd and um, alternative facts anywhere else in the world, we would call those propaganda, 
right? It is, an, it is outright lies. It is the manipulation of political information for the benefit of an individual or political party. And again, the fact that the Republican Party, a, cent a party central to democratic competition in this country, just seemed to go along with this kind of propaganda, even buy into it, shamefully buy into that propaganda on the date of January 6th by promulgating the big lie that Trump had potentially won the election. It, it's, it's so damaging, it's incredibly damaging, right? And um, I give the example here on the slide of Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez, because he um, is an example of a Latin American caudillo, who I'll just scooch my slide over here, a Latin American caudillo who um, both effectively utilized the media to, um, to shore up support for himself, but he was also the victim of conservative media bias against him. And part of the reason why his presidency was so divisive and problematic for Venezuelan democracy was because of this division and manipulation of the media. So um, am, I, am I about at about five minutes, Gareth? Okay, great. So with that, I'll close. If, if anybody has um, uh, uh, questions about my mom, <laughs> you can, um, I can speak to that a little bit more later on, but with that, I'll, I'll end my remarks. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the panelists. I actually am going to put um, the article that was published last week um, that you wrote, uh, Carlene, in the chat. So folks want to check that out. Um, there, I don't see any questions in the chat. I have a question just to sort of start things off here, and this can go to everybody. Um, it came up throughout almost all of your presentations and the things you talked about today, this idea of the big lie um, and how that has become, um, you know, something that we're almost used to at this point. Um, and, and this idea of um, uh, uh, this, this grievance culture and this sense of entitlement. Um, I'm just curious for each of you, you know, what do you think is motivating that? Um, and, and why has it, like, why are there so many people that, that are accepting that at this point um, in our history? And this can be to anybody. Anybody can jump in from the panel. Well, I'll, I'll go and I'm going to basically assign much of it to the internet. And while the, the internet has made information very accessible to us where we can get loads and loads of information um, in a heartbeat, um, it also has made people um, part of social networks that are very reinforcing of what they want to believe. And so they can find each other. And so people with extreme views can find each other there, regardless of where they live in the United States. Um, it, it, it allows for the promulgation of, um, of, of lies or, or misinformation. Um, I, I certainly found myself sometimes finding some things that were said in social media and believing them um, because they were consistent with my preferences, only to embarrassing later on find out that actually that, <laughs> that fact was not really true um, <clears throat> there. And so there's been less reliance on news organizations, on the mainstream news organizations, more criticism of them. And also, you know, this promotion of, of other types of news organizations um, all over the place that really are much more interesting and interested in a profit kind of finding their niche within the popular culture and attracting viewers who are there to get armed with arguments um, to support what they already believe. And, and that I just think is, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have an answer for that, but that's, that's my two cents on that. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Kathy. So I, I kind of wonder whether um, we blame the internet too much um, that we blame Trump too much, frankly. And that um, looking backward obviously um, makes me think that the problem is much deeper. So if you look at US history, obviously, and think about reconstruction and then the unraveling reconstruction, and then obviously the settling of Jim Crow that then moved north, I'm uncomfortable calling the US a democracy at least until 1965. And I think that what really threatens our democracy is not a bunch of rioters entering the Capitol, but it's really these voter suppression tactics. It's building into our very institutions and our laws, um, racial discrimination and inequalities that are legal, that are democratic, that were passed by state legislators all over the place, 
but in fact, we know um, undermine democracy and, and magnify racial inequality. So right now for me, on one hand, this moment feels a bit like the 1930s in terms of pre-fascism, um, the big lie, all that, it, it definitely does. Um, but that's when I have my eyes on Trump. But when I shift my eyes to look at what's been going on for years before Trump and what's going on throughout the nation in terms of the Republican Party and Republican legislators, I get really worried. Trump will be gone, but these voter registration laws, hostility, um, uh, look at what happened in Florida, for example, Democratic um, decision that um, uh, ex-felons can vote, and then what happens? The state comes in and decides that you have to pay all your fines and you have to file extra paperwork. So for me, I, I really, Trump, I'm, I, I'm bored with, um, and I'm more worried about the fact that this might feel like 1890 instead of 1930. Thank you. Kathy, I, I think you're right that there is some kind of master narrative here that's really pervasive and powerful. Um, just again, thinking about the fact that I know someone very intimately who participated on that day. Um, you know, my mom was a single mom for a very long time in her life. She um, lived on the verge of poverty for sections of her life. Um, and she, you know, she also only has an, a high school education and doesn't really think critically about very much of what's happened in politics. Um, yet there is this master narrative within the United States that if you just work hard enough and, you know, um, and take advantage of all of your opportunities, you're going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And so someone like my mom who looks, you know, and says, well, you know, there are these, there's this other group of people that seem to be getting, quote, special treatment. Um, it goes against that master narrative. Um, you and I and almost everybody in this room we recognize that there are, that it is built into the very fabric of this country, that there is systemic racism. Our country was built on the backs of slaves, but that's not what people are taught in elementary school. And it's not um, how white people, large portions of white people in this country think. And so someone like my mom, who, you know, feels like she worked hard to, to earn what she has, um, continues to have this sense of entitlement because this is what this is one of the dominant master narratives that exists in our country. Thank you. Misha, any thoughts about that, the big lie? And then we'll turn to some of the questions in the chat. Well, yeah, I was just gonna bring up the fact that um, I don't think, yeah, I think we have to think about like, it's not just Trump, but I feel like Trump made these people feel comfortable showing themselves and people that have these ideologies feel comfortable like outwardly saying it because like you said systematic racism these people have always existed um far right has always existed i just feel like trump and the fact that he enables this and the fact that he says it out of his own mouth he's blatantly racist you know um i think that just made people comfortable more comfortable with violence racism and all of this stuff so that's just what i wanted to add yeah great thank you um, we do have some questions coming in. The first one was submitted by at least the screen name is Frank Silky. Um, does that person want to unmute and go ahead and ask their question if they're still here? There we go. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, thoughts about the future of the Republican Party? Anybody want to jump in? Um, I'm not sure where they're going, and I, I think it's critically important where they do go. <laughs> um, and I, I see, I see. You know, I mean, obviously, in a democracy, we need more than one party, so there has to be party competition. And, um, and when one one is always going to be on one side and thus disagree with some things on the other side, but we're we're hoping that there's going to be some agreement on the rules of the game. And what we saw happen now is there was not agreement on the rules of the game. And that you know, parts of the Republican Party were advocating for things that were really not democratic, and, and that is really most concerning. <clears throat> I think. I mean. I mean. I'm not sure where they're going to go. I certainly have hopes as to where they would go, and there'd be greater embracement of democracy. I, I think there are a few Republicans who, um, you know, are, are saying, "Yep, yeah, 
Biden won. At least then they're they're telling the truth about the matter. Um, there's still, I mean, kind of the worry is there's another part of the party that may, maybe the Josh Harley, Holly, that's looking at Trump as a playbook for the future, and and kind of say, well, well, I can maybe do that. And that's a path to get the nomination, and maybe I could even do it better and take it further and be more successful than he was in terms of staying in power longer. That's, um, I think, the scary thing, that there's kind of now this, this bit of a model that's there. Any thoughts from the other panelists? Future of the Republican Party. Nope, no takers there. Um, the next person in the queue here is Jim Allen. Uh, Jim, if you want to go ahead and unmute uh, and ask that first question around the people who are not hardcore activists. Yeah, it, it, I, I wonder how significant it is that the insurrection that people who weren't hardcore activists participated in the, inter the insurrection you usually think of people being pretty far out there doing something like this. And if there are parallels, for instance, in the former Yugoslavia uh, about the breakdown of civil society with this kind of event. So I, I'll take a stab at it again, knowing someone who flew across the country to participate. Um, I think it. I think it's a couple of things. I think um, for a long time, political scientists and Professor Cuck knows more about this than I do. But for a long time, um, political scientists have identified certain types of voters as being really motivated and mobilized around identity. Um, and I think that Trump really spoke to a certain sector of the population. He really tapped into something about their identity. We could talk about it in terms of whiteness, in terms of class, in terms of vision of success, in terms of masculinity. I think there are all kinds of ways that Trump spoke to a certain type of person's identity. Um, my mom flew to DC with my aunt. Um, she is a businesswoman. To her, making money is everything. To them, Trump is a famous person who just speaks directly to the kind of, I mean, I guess values um, that they have. And so I think people were really mobilized around a strong identity and feeling like it was cool to participate in this moment in history. Um, and again, many of them, I know my mom was not, was not thinking about democracy on that day. She was not. I was terrified, but my mom was not thinking about that. She was thinking of being, a, a, you know, supporting this particular individual in a way that, you know, she thought was, he was treated badly. She believed it, you know? So I think we do have to be aware. I mean, many people believed this, they believed it. And I think Professor Harold put in the chat, Trump himself may have even believed it. So that's my thought. Any other thoughts from the panel on that? You know, what's motivating folks who aren't maybe, you know, as radicalized or, you know, as extreme? Jeff, when we were playing this, that was one of the things you had mentioned was this like intensity of engagement, you know, that when we saw it on the day, it was like, oh my gosh, look at all these people yeah. here. Well, I mean, I, I very much uh, share Professor West's thoughts about it and, and think she's um, very much hitting the nail on the head there. I mean, part of it, again, is that white identity and, and the feeling that it, some of us would kind of find disbelieving in, in that there are whites who feel under threat because they're white. Um, whether or not that's, that's true or has some basis on reality, there, there is a fact that they, they actually somehow um, feel that way. And he was able to tap into that and mobilize those people in a way that I, really surprising. I mean, and just kind of parenthetically, as I read about the people who were arrested and, and some of those who were most prominent, I was surprised to learn how actually financially successful um, many of them were. You know, they, they, they were not people who were just scraping by. Many of them had professional jobs and at least by American standards, maybe not super rich, but doing very well, but somehow still feel very aggrieved um, they're in a very um, polarized environment racially and in terms of partisanship. And, and that brought them to travel across the country and, and risk their lives. And, and many of them are now arrested um, and really, you know, just incredibly <clears throat> under, I think, 
feeling threatened and then showing quite a bit of commitment to, to the man at the top. Great, thank you. I, I struggle a bit too with this tension between, um, I think there's a tendency to blame poor white, you know, that, and if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but people making over $100,000 a year voted more for Trump than they did for Biden. Um, and certainly I think that, you know, the motives are, are, are varied. Um, but I, 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 the thing I struggle with is um, kind of looking so much at their victimization as an excuse then to explain instead of also, and maybe we need to do this at the same time, recognize the deep sense of entitlement. And I think Misha was right. I mean, you can't overlook racism is to me, that's the glue holding all this together. And I, I think Trump was brilliant because he first went after obviously Mexican immigrants. He went after um, quote, you know, people coming from Muslim nations, and then the anti-black rhetoric really picked up. So I think he pulled people in who were suspicious of outsiders, you know, suspicious, you know, that that were had a lot of Islamophobia, and then all of a sudden it became a bit more acceptable to wonder about well, African Americans as well. So I, I really struggle with this on one hand, thinking it's really important for us to understand where they came from, but sometimes it starts to feel like a therapy session that's not deserved, frankly. Um, and instead what we need to do is, and this is where I go back to late 19th century, early 20th century, because you see the same kinds of arguments made. Who's attracted to the KKK and why? And it's this mix of, I'm a victim, but actually I'm really entitled at the same time. Yeah, I noticed that in your presentation, um, just the language that was used back then, it's very similar to what we hear today, you know, sort of framing people as the other and, um, you know, I, I caught that in your in your presentation. So um, I want to move to the next question because I think um, uh, Misha, this sort of um, relates to, to your um, presentation and also continues on this. So Kate Shields, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Kate's still here. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so my question was, do you believe that the rioters should have been able to walk away? Could this have been a strategic decision based on specific risks of further violence or did it simply happen? And then I added an examination of the contrast between police behavior in this incident and during the protests following the killing of George Floyd, for example, seems crucial to this question. Misha, is that something you feel? You could, you could feel that? Okay, so you mean like, should they have been able to walk away meaning nobody gets arrested, everyone just goes home kind of situation. Okay, um, I think I think it's hard because um, you can't arrest um, like a million people. It wasn't a million people, but you can't arrest like, you know, that many people, but at the same time, it's like, that was crazy. And like, you know, doing that to a Capitol building is an offense. So I do think that whoever, you know, w went past the line of peaceful protest and just peacefully you know, saying their piece and how they feel about the elections should be arrested. Um, because when it comes to comparing that to the George Floyd protests, um, those aren't riots. Those are protests and they're peaceful. And anytime it was a riot, it was most likely fueled by law enforcement because um, a lot of the times where the looting started, it was actually started by police officers, undercover police officers that were trying to fuel the riots and make it look like um, that it was a part of the protest. And that's like proven and there's videos and like proof of that. So I don't know about strategic, um, that's like a really good question because I feel like regardless of what happens and who gets arrested, this is gonna continue. Um, like, cause like we said, like people feel comfortable now um, and they feel like they can show themselves and act this way. So um, yeah, I don't think they should be able to walk away for sure. But um, I also don't think that just because they're arrested that it's gonna stop. Um, so I don't think it was too strategic. I just think that if they didn't make any arrests, um, there would have been a lot of counter protests. And I think that that's what they're trying to um, avoid. I don't think they actually care about arresting or actually think these people are wrong. I just think they want to avoid any counter protests or anything that could have escalated after this because there was no actions taken against the um, rioters in this situation. All right, thank you. Anybody else from the panel have thoughts about that question? about how we deal with the folks who were there. And, you know, there's tens, tens of thousands of people there is my understanding. We obviously can't arrest all of them. Um, just that difference between how, um, you know, so many black protesters or folks connected to BLM were treated throughout the summer as compared to, you know, what we saw on TV unfolding on the 6th. Okay. 
Um, I, I, I certainly find disheartening looking back is what happened um, when Trump went to the church for the photo opportunity and they, they cleared out the area there forcefully with, with tear gas <laughs> for that, uh, clearing out people um, you know, who are engaged in a, as best I can tell, a, a legal peaceful protest. <laughs> I mean, I just also cannot believe that that was happening. I, I actually can't believe you know, that there's not more reaction to that and, and even really um, you know, raises the question as to who should be arrested there and who was engaged in wrongdoing. Good point. Um, let's see, next question, Aaron Harold, you have a question I'd like to put to the panel. Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, Professor West uh, briefly touched on it, but I guess my question was, a lot of you use the term big lie, and um, I was just wondering if a lie is a knowing falsehood, um, is Trump really lying, or does he, there are some accounts that suggested that he actually believed it. Um, the, the same shouldn't be said for people like Hawley and Cruz, of course, they, uh, they should know better, but if that's the case, then we had a different kind of constitutional crisis after January 6th, namely we might have had a, a, someone who was in, genuinely deluded as president of the United States and commander in chief, and we should therefore count ourselves lucky that we got through it. So I don't know if, um, what the panelists would like to say about that, but I wanted to throw that out there. I have there was one. Oh, sorry. So sorry, Carly. Kathy. Go ahead. Oh, Carly, you go first. There was one president of Ecuador. He, um, his nickname, he fondly referred to himself as a loco, which means the crazy person. Which, again, speaking of irony, became incredibly ironic when the the Congress um, impeached him for mental um, illness, um, for being uh, mentally incompetent to hold office. Um, so maybe it was just another instance of our politics replicating those in Latin America where we did have a mentally incompetent president. I kind of think that um, it's kind of fascist in a sense. The, the whole point of lying is that you know you're lying. And the people, a lot of the people you're lying to know it too, but you get away with that. You get to determine your reality. I think there's a joy in that, that he has. Whether or not he finally you know, believes these, but I think getting away, I mean, he knows, he knows, he, he, he's admitted that he knows that he lies. The whole point is, and the fun part of it for him is that he gets away with it. So the more he does it, the more incentive he has to keep going. Um, and to me, that's fascism is, you know, you get to lie as much as you want and you know, it's a lie, but it doesn't matter because you have the power to do it. Great. Thank you. Looks like we'll get to a, a couple more questions here. Um, Aspen Griffin, uh, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Sure. Uh, my question is, um, if these rioters were to have succeeded in storming the Capitol before Congress could have been evacuated, could they have threatened our democracy by like forcing Congress to name Trump as president or whatever else it could have done at the stake of the Congress's lives? Or would there be some sort of like protection against them just effectively controlling the U.S.? I, mean, I, I don't see how they could have really succeeded. I, I'm not sure anybody would take it as legitimate if someone voted in a certain way, let's say to decertify, that was done by force and coercion. <clears throat> so that would immediately, at least in my mind, kind of in, invalidate it. it. It seemed like what Trump was trying to, to do is create enough chaos um, in the country. And he certainly did create some contemporary chaos um, there for that period. You know, but it, 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 it's just kind of the fact that we kind of are think about those questions and you had 20 former secretaries of defense, you know, sign a statement indicating that, you know, the military, military in the United States stays out of elections, does not intervene. From what I understand, that was led by Dick Cheney. I, I mean, just that they were thinking about doing that and, and felt they had to do that and issue that is, is in and of itself just kind of very alarming. Um, this question looks like it was directed to uh, Professor West. Um, Andrew Hart, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute. Yes, yes. Um, just, a, just a question. Do, I wrote, does Latin America's history of uh, strong men and populism present any lessons for how to recover that might be applicable? Well, one of the things that I, I hope happens, but it's not looking likely, is that 
we do use our formal institutions, we continue to rely and reinforce our formal institutions to hold this kind of activity accountable. So I know that there are a lot of people thinking, you know, is, is Trump convicting Trump? Is that really a, a politically um, savvy way forward? For me, for me, as someone who, you know, looks at what keeps democracy strong around the world, I do think it's very important to strengthen, to rely on our existing institutions and hold this kind of undemocratic activity accountable, so. Great, thanks. I think we have time for maybe one or maybe two more. Um, Sarah, and I'm sorry for your last name, I know I won't get it right, Fadloi. Sarah, do you wanna go ahead and unmute? Yeah, um, so I was wondering like what implications the insurrection has for other far right movements in the US like other white supremacist movements or abroad particularly. I mean like much, I know that you guys aren't European historians but I was especially thinking of a lot of the um, far right European parties that have some holding in parliament and if it would have given them motivation to try something similar. I mean, what, what I think is going to happen is those extremist groups now with a, a different president and a different attorney general are going to receive a lot more scrutiny um, than they have been over the past four years. So that's, that's one thing that's, that's going to go on. Um, at the same time, I, I mean, there's some organization that there that they developed, uh, you know, the, the event itself, you know, the January 6th. Um, event um, may may for some be kind of a mobilizing event for some. <clears throat> so I, I think you know it's it's not really um, clear. I mean I mean Trump was certainly encouraging <laughs> a lot of activity. I mean what, what he did and the the um, words that Garth showed what what Trump had said. Um, Trump had made some statements about the need to liberate Michigan, and then lo and behold, there's a movement there to um, you know capture, take hostage the, the governor of Michigan. I really, I really don't, so, so that's kind of a, a big thing to me, what, what also goes on at the elite level as well as what happens at the mass level. If there had been, uh, let's say a John Kasich or a Jeb Bush had become president in 2016, I have a harder time seeing some of these things happening, even, even with all the other stuff still in play. But that's, that's my thoughts on that. I do think all eyes are on the United States right now. Um, there, you know, I talk about Trump borrowing from the playbook of Latin American dictators, but Latin American presidents are already also starting to borrow from the playbook of Trump. Um, we see, you know, the Brazilian president Jair Bolsonaro, who is he's he, you know, loves to refer to himself as the Latin American Trump, the Brazilian Trump, you know. Um, and so I do think that it, it, what happened here is very dangerous and it can be inspiring, especially to, to some, you know, maybe poor countries that sort of in some ways like look up to the United States. Um, I think it's really troubling. Yeah, I guess so go ahead, go ahead, please. Um, like thinking, thinking back, I imagine for um, a lot of people living in the US in the 18, 70s, early 1880s, they could never have imagined what life would be like by 1890s, turn of the century. So we, we have the sense that we're always moving in one direction. And I think that this is a wake up call that um, we could look like a very different country with very different norms and institutions and a very different quasi democracy again, if we're not careful. Great. Well, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are at 3.45. And so thanks for, for pushing that extra 50 minutes. I really appreciate it from the panelists. Um, I do want to just say thanks again for everybody's time, um, the panelists for putting together your presentations and spending this afternoon with us. Um, wants to want to once again thank um, uh, Stacy Robertson, the provost, and uh, our VP for uh, Student and Campus Life, Mike Taberski. Um, and I also want to thank my colleagues in the Center for Community who um, you know helped me out with with putting this together today. Um, obviously, there's about 20 questions left in the chat. We we didn't get close, um, and so you know I had a feeling that would happen. And maybe we can look into doing some more of these throughout the semester so we don't forget what happened and we don't just kind of move on to the next big thing that takes place. Um, I think it's important to really process these 
Um, and again, this is the space for that. Um, we can have these dialogues. Um, so I really appreciate everybody spending um, this hour uh, and 15 minutes with us and um, look forward to seeing you all again, um, wh whether that be on Zoom or in person uh, on campus. So, so thank you all so very much. Um, I will record this and I'll put it up on my website uh, on the Geneseo uh, website, the volunteerism page, and I'll share that with the panelists as well. So thanks everybody, have a great afternoon and um, we'll see you soon.